أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله I seek refuge with Allah from the reject, rejected Satan with the name of Allah the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. All praises is due to Allah, the Lord, the cherisher, the sustainer, the caretaker, the guardian, the evolver of all systems of knowledge, known and unknown. And prayers and peace be upon our leader, Muhammad, and upon his companions, his family, all of them together. I bear witness that there is no God except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is the conformer to Allah and the messenger of Allah. <coughs> Allah la ilaha illa hu al hayy al qayyum la ta'khudhu sinatu wa la nawm lahu ma fi samawati wa ma fi al ard ma dalladhi yashfa'u anduhu illa bi ithni ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfuhum wa la yuhaytuna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bima sha'a وسيع كرسيه السماوات والارض ولا يؤوده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي امين امين uh once again the last two things that i said were i to kursi in the prayer of moses i i spoke those in arabic instead of english uh both of which are dua, dua that um, inshallah that we say every day. Uh, I know I definitely try to get them in every day. Uh, Ayat Kursi exalts Allah, it exalts his position and who he is, relationship to us, who he is to us. And by reciting Ayat Kursi several times, one, two, three times, you there is protection in it from Allah and his angels and the prayer of Moses uh, the prayer of Moses where Moses asked Allah to expand his chest um, take the impediment away from his speech make his task easy for him so that the people may understand him uh, Moses prayed that prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before going to speak to Pharaoh and and you guys y'all know how much I love Moses I love Moses I love Moses because Moses's story lines up with our story like almost almost one to one almost exact if if you study it if you look at it and if you study the different different parts of it that Allah gives you in the Quran because he gives you his story in pieces a pieces in this ayat most of which is in back sort of Bakura and he gives you a piece here piece there uh, Moses is mentioned way more times in the Quran than Muhammad May peace and blessings be upon both of them. But Moses is is really popular in the Quran, and Allah talks about Moses a lot. And there's a reason for that. You know, sometimes we have to just dial back and look at the numbers. Everything now is big data, numbers, analytics. Everybody is trying to analyze data. We have the internet, we have social media, we have so much data online. People are putting information online. I like this, I like that. I prefer this, I prefer that, I do this, I do that. There's so much inter uh, information online that now the big thing now is big data. And what they do with that data, they have to sit through it. They have to analyze it in order to make it make sense and when they and when they analyze the data they're able to pull from it and able to 
to understand certain things from it. A data analyst, that's a, you know, that's a big job, a, a high paying job in tech. And they pay people to do nothing but analyze information that's coming in from everywhere. Billions and billions of, uh, of, of bytes and bits of information. So the same thing has to be done with the Quran and the data that's, that's in it. And, and we've been, you know, Muslims do that. We do that. But the Quran is endless. It's endless information. It's endless data. It's infinite, I should say. So we look at we look at the Quran and we look at the number of times that Moses is mentioned. I forget the number. I think it's like a hundred and something, or it's like eighty to a hundred or something like that. And you look at how many times he's mentioned as opposed to other prophets. And, he, and just this is basic basic common sense. You would say to yourself, well, there's a lot to be learned from his story. His story is very important to humanity, to the future of humanity, because the Quran is the last revelation. So his story has to be very important or very relevant to human beings as they exist from, from then. 1400 years ago when the Quran was revealed till the end of time it is always relevant and his, his story is one of the most relevant and, and you know Muslims that trying to be super Muslim you know you can argue you can debate with me with Prophet Muhammad well, okay all right I'm just <laughs> sure but I'm just going I'm going according to what God said and how much he spoke about Moses in the Quran and the children of Israel as well. The Bani Israel, the children of Israel. So I look at Moses and I look at his stories in the Quran and I'm, I'm always, I'm always trying to draw comparisons to, <coughs> to what's happening today in our lives, right now. And there's this one story, and I know everyone knows this story, where uh, Moses was sent to, to go against the, the magicians of the time, Pharaoh's best magicians. So, you know, Moses... He he went up. He was told sent to the magicians, and you know Allah, um, Allah gave him the rod. So Moses went up against Pharaoh's best magicians, armed with truth, because that's what the rod was. It was it was the light of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It was it was truth. That's it was plain. It was just the truth. So. The truth that Moses possessed, the rod, was ex exposed what the magicians faked. As it says in the Quran, he exposed what they faked. That's literally what it says in the Quran. So, looking at that story and then, and then just looking and just constantly thinking about the situ about the world and in particular my world as an African American Muslim just looking at just looking at our world you you begin to make parallels you see you see similarities like I said Moses' story and his experiences really can almost line up with the African American experience, almost one to one, it's uncanny. 
So, looking at looking at us, looking at African Americans, and like I say, I'm speaking from the perspective of an African American Muslim because that's what I am, and I have to speak from my experiences. Otherwise, I'm faking. If I come out, if I come on here and I talk for other people, other groups, then I'm a, I'm faking. I'm one of those magicians. I'm fake. So I'm speaking from my perspective as an African American. I'm and I'm pretty sure most or uh, everybody on the line is African American as well. I I don't know who's listening. I don't know if the FBI is listening to the government. Like we don't know. So. <laughs> You know, I, I like to point that out. Like, I'm, okay, I'm speaking as me, as an African American. But the story of uh, Moses and the magicians, it lines up, or I see a parallel with the African American community as it relates to the broader American community, the rest of America. And Black people in America, they are synonymous with the rod or the staff or the stick, whatever the stick that Moses had. And the rest of America, the rest of America, I see them as the magicians that threw false magic. And <coughs> And the reason I say that is because African American people in this country, African Americans, and that's redundant, but African Americans have always been the, the truth and the, the heart and soul of this country. African American people have always held America to the standards that it, it it would it espouses in the Constitution. African American people have we've always been that. Also, when other people, other groups, come to America, the way you can tell what type of person they are, what type of character they are is how they treat and how they associate with African Americans. So us, our group of people, we, we are more like the rod of truth that, that swallows falsehood, that magicians try to throw out to the people to put them on a certain facade or image. And it happens over and over again, and usually other groups, um, white white people, um, yeah, immigrant, other immigrant groups, usually they want to silence black people or act as if black people don't don't exist, or push them to the side, or not even mention them because when you have someone, when you have one of us next to anyone else then we, we kind of expose other people. Because however, that, however those other groups treat us will show who they are in their intentions. And, and, this, and, and this is likened, this is the, it's really the exact same thing that happened with Moses and the magicians. Where him having this truth and, this, and the magicians having their falsehood and they're throwing out their falsehood, they're putting out their falsehood. Oh, you know, to give an example, America's this, America's, you know, post-racial, America's, you know, it's for the free, it's for, you know, it's, there's equality, you know, so forth and so on. All the things that, you know, all men are created equal. All the things that Americans like to throw out. That America likes to throw out to the rest of the world. But then you have, you, you look at black people and you say, well, wait a minute. You, you guys are saying you're this and that, but 
Look at how you're treating black people. And that's usually how other countries kind of check America. They they use black people. They say, well, look, well, look how you're treating your citizens. And what that does is, once again, it's it's like that rod. It's like the staff of Moses. It's like that truthhood swallowing the falsehood that these magicians are throwing out. Now, this is this is true in the greater American society, but also in the Muslim community. We, let's let's you know drill down to the Muslim. American community. And if you drill down, you'll find that the same thing is true. The same thing is true. Muslim Americans that come to this country, they espouse certain, uh, they espouse the, uh, the tenets of Islam. Want for your brother what you want for yourself. The Muslim community is one ummah. If one part hurts, everybody you know, rushes to fix it. Whatever you, you know, you know all the talk. Oh, there's no racism in Islam. Oh, you know, the, Allah said, uh, Prophet Muhammad said that you know an Arab is not better. You know all the talk. But when it comes to African American Muslims in this country and how we are treated by other groups, once again, you see you see something different. The actions don't line up with the speech. Once again, African American uh, African American people. In this case, the Muslims are the staff of Moses exposing the falsehood that others are throwing out, that the other Muslim groups are throwing out. And <coughs> And this is, to me, it's, it's very important to, to keep, to bring this up and to, to, to keep it as a reminder. Because now, because we, we are coming up on a new decade now. We're coming up on a new decade. You know, we're going into the 2020s. And we need, we need to set the tone now, at the beginning of the decade, before the decade begins. The tone has to be set for the next decade, or in, in really the next era in America. Or, or the next era of America. We're moving into a new era. A new decade, but also a new era. And we need to set the tone for that era. And it's being set. It's being set, subhanAllah. Some of this stuff, we see, we don't have any control over some of this stuff. Some of this stuff is just going to happen. Why? Because Allah says it's time for a change. Allah says, be it is. It's time, it's going to change. And there ain't nothing that any of us can do about it. But we can, we can read the signs and say, uh-oh, what? Okay. Looks like, looks like things are changing. And it looks like they're going in this direction. 
So let me be intelligent and not try to, to fight it or go against it. Let me go with the way because it's God that's making this change. He's moving everything. He's shifting the paradigm. So the intelligent thing to do is to, is to go with the way. You can come willingly or unwillingly. It's up to you. But you're coming. We're going into a new era, a new decade. And you can go in, you can go in with the flow, with the 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 thunder of Allah. Or you can go you can go in against it. But it's happening. And, and I and yes, I am so bold as to say that the black American experience is likened to a prophet's experience. Yes, a prophet and his people. Yes. Our experiences of biblical proportions, as they say. Yes, we are that important. Yes. Why can I say that? Well, simply put, the whole entire world that we live in now was built on us. Yes, this whole modern world, this industri industrial revolution, the Renaissance, the, all, all this stuff was built on us. Everything we have now, everything Europe has, America, the superpowers, it was built on us. So yes, we are very, very important to world history. And yes, I do believe that Allah is going to take us, these slaves, those were, that were made slaves, that were enslaved, whatever terminology you like to use, I Yes, I believe that Allah is going to make us, take us, and put us into leadership. Just like he did the Bani Israel. Same story. Bani Israel were led out of Egypt to the promised land. And once they made it to the promised land, once they were taken out of the oppression, out of the slavery, and led to the promised land, they established themselves. And then you have King David. Then you have Solomon, Suleiman, Alayhi Masalam. Uh, both of them, Allah, may peace be upon both of them. Suleiman. It is said that Suleiman was given more than any other prophet. But he comes from the slavery experience, experience. Moses had to lead the Bani Israel out of slavery to the promised land. And then and they were able to build, and then comes King David, and then comes uh, uh, King uh, Dawood or David, and then comes Solomon or Suleiman. And Suleiman was running everything. <laughs> Suleiman had control of everything. We know the stories in the Quran. But this this stems from Moses' story. And if we're looking, if we're comparing our story to Moses' story, 
which is pretty much the only two times in history that people were enslaved at that level by the world, by the superpower at the time. It only, it only happened twice. Them and us. So this this ain't this this ain't far fetched. What I'm talking about. But God is, I be, this is why I believe God is with us. Because of Moses' story. And I'm looking at our story and I'm saying this is, oh, it's the, this is the same thing. It's happening over, it's happening again. And the children of Israel, the Bani Israel, they were blessed. They were, they, they ended up, you know, becoming rulers, becoming superpowers in the world at the time. So, <coughs> so us, African American people here in this country, and once again, I'm speaking from my perspective as an African American, unapologetically. As a person who both parents on both sides of the family descend from slaves in this country. We, we have a, a very uh, special future in this country. And not just in this country, on this planet. King Solomon was affecting world history. He was affecting the world around him. He had so, he, his army was so mighty. He was given, he had so much. He was affecting the world around him. This is our destiny. This is our destiny as African Americans, as descendants of slaves. We're very special. And yes, we are that important. And yes, I believe that. With all my heart, one three thousand percent. And yes, we are the, the rod of Moses in that story. We are the rod. You put us against another group in this country and that other group, if they're not honest, if they're not sincere, they're going to be exposed by the way that they treat us. With that rod of truth, that staff of truth. So, <clears throat> so we're going into a new year. <clears throat> and, ah, excuse me. And, and, and we have to set the tone. And it's all, and, and even if we, if, if we don't do anything, or even if we're not conscious of it, it's already happening. But, but, but black people in this country, we've, we've done so much for this country. We've been there at every turn, faithful, loyal to America. And it's in other there have been other parts in history, in our history, American history, where black people have been there at the beginning of the decade to set the tone. Even if we go back all the way to to slavery, and we can start there. The first slaves were brought over at the beginning of a decade, 1619. <laughs> 
it, it's so crazy how this stuff line. It, it's crazy how this stuff lines up. So the first slaves were brought over to Jamestown, I believe, in 1619. We're in 2019 right now. And on the cusp of that new decade, which would be six, the 1620s, that slavery started. And, and literally, it, it changed the course of what would become America in 1776, officially. So black people, once again, were right there at the beginning of the decade, working. Changing, affecting the tone, setting the tone for the decade and for hundreds of years to come after that. Slavery was an era. It wasn't positive, but we, we did set the tone. It was us, our ancestors. Fast forward to the end of slavery, or towards the end of slavery, you have the Civil War, which started in 1861. Started in 1861 and ended in 1865. 1861 that was the 1860s that was a different 60s but it was in the 1860s that we fought the Civil War and that black people turned the tide of the Civil War because black people started fighting black people chose a side that we could have fought for the South it could have been good slaves and soft fought for the slap, but no. Black people changed the tide of America, changed the course, and fought loyally to keep the country unified. And that was in eighteen that was in the eighteen sixties. So during in that decade, we set the tone once again, and that can that continued because America is a country, it remained a single country, and that flowed and that flowed into Reconstruction. Now they have Reconstruction listed from 1863 to 1877, but Reconstruction if if the Civil War ended in 1865, then Reconstruction has to be after that. So, we're going into the 1870s. And so, in the 1860s and the 1870s, once again, black people were at the forefront of setting the tone for this country. And if you don't, if you don't remember Reconstruction, or it's not... Fresh Reconstruction was about African American uh, civil rights. And during that time of Reconstruction, that at black people were doing very well. It was post Civil War, and African Americans were given, given several rights by the government, they were backed by the government. And African Americans did were doing really well, which and white poor whites were not. This is all right after slavery. So after the Reconstruction, after the, the tone was set with black people again in the seven, 1870s, and then after the 1870s, Jim Crow started to pop up. And that set the tone all the way 
to the 60s again when black people stood up again in the civil rights. So black people set the tone in the Civil War in the 1860s and then back in the 1960s, a hundred years later, we did it again. We set the tone. And that, in the 60s, the Civil Rights Act, the 60s, 60s, that reverberated around the entire planet. And I know most, uh, most of you on the lifeline lived it. I know you guys lived it. I didn't live it. But, but as an intelligent person, I can go back and hindsight is 2020. I can go back and look on it and say, wow. And study it. And say, wow, look. That movement of the 60s did all of that around the world. It was the civil rights movement of the 60s that opened up immigration that allowed these immigrants to come over here, that are here now. It didn't start it, but it opened it up, opened up mass immigration. Black people fought for that. It was the civil rights of the 60s that gave other African countries the courage to stand up to their colonizers, their oppressors, and gain independence. If you look at the independence celebrations of African countries today, you notice they're all in the 70s, 80s, 90s, after the Civil Rights Movement. So, <coughs> once black people, African American people have set the tone for the world on several occasions, And just, say, just like as in 1860, the 1860s, we had the Civil War where black people fought, stood up, and then afterwards, Jim Crow took hold after the Civil Rights, after the 60s and 70s, the Civil Rights era. We had the 80s, the crack epidemic. In the 90s, the prison epidemic. So now, now we're we're here in 2019 now. And we, we're back at we're back at 1619. We're back at slavery. And slavery is coincidentally the topic of conversation this year because this is the 400th year anniversary of when the first slaves came. But the conversation is different now. The conversation is different. Now, the conversation is reparations for slavery. The conversation now is, as black people, we need to all um, We need to all support this idea of us being an ethnic group because of our past in slavery. That's the conversation now in 2019. From 1619, now we're in 2019. And slavery is right back at the forefront. And once again, this is the 400th year anniversary of slavery, of the first slaves coming here in 2019. But last, last week, let me let me inject this into the um, into what I'm saying. Last week, or not not last week, but the week before last, on the 15th, 
I spoke about popular culture. And I spoke about how we as Muslims, it's imperative for us to infuse popular culture, Islam with popular culture in America. I spoke about how this has all, the blueprint has already been set, it's already been done with the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and Elijah Muhammad and Mel Wolf Dean Muhammad. It's already been done before. And that legacy needs to continue. But in order to do that, in order to do that, we have to know what's popular. We got to know what's popular. And spoiler alert, what's going to be popular from now, coming going into the next era of America and the next decade, what's going to be popular is black issues. Black issues. <coughs> right now, right now, as we speak, one of the most popular shows on TV is a show called uh, Watchmen. Watchmen. Uh, Watchmen, it, it, it's on HBO. It's a miniseries, like eight episodes. Uh, Regina King is the star of this show. Now, to give you a little bit of history on Watchmen, the Watchmen is a comic book. From the 70s, I believe. The 60s or the 70s. And the Watchmen comic book is considered one of the most um, influential comic books of all time. In all of history. In all of comic book history. And, you know, that's including Superman in the 20s and all the way up till Spider-Man and Iron Man and Avengers and now. The Watchmen, that's considered one of the most popular or the most influential comic books of all time. I've actually studied the comic book in college. So this show, HBO decided to do a series. Basically continuing the story of The Watchmen. And when the first episode aired, the very first episode was about the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre. Now, let me <coughs> let me let me let me try to put it in some more perspective. This show was based on one of the most influential comic books in all of history. People were waiting on this show. They were waiting on it. It was anticipated. They were analyzing it before it came out. They were analyzing the trailers and it was it was a buzz. But they didn't know that the show was going to highlight black issues. All they knew was that Regina King was the star, but they didn't know that what the show would actually focus on black issues and racism. And that's what the show has done. It's on episode six now, and episode six was a doozy. That. They threw the racism right in everybody's face. So the, one of the most popular shows on TV, which is a show of a comic book, if you don't know, comic books are the most popular thing. That comic books are pop culture. So uh, this 
show about one of the most popular comic books decided to take black culture and put that front and center as the backdrop to their new show. Now they spent millions and millions of dollars on these shows. HBO. And they decided to put black culture on the in as on the forefront. You see, this is why this is why I follow popular culture. This is why I'm so into it. Because it's it's showing you where we are as a society. And right now, in 2019, 400 years after the first slaves were brought to America, exactly 400 years, in a time where we're selling, we're celebrating four, I don't know if we're celebrating, but we're recognizing 400 years of us, our ancestors in this country. What's most popular right now are black issues. It's in the movies, in the comic books, it's in the shows. And the black community is on code or on board or we are all together in that hey look it's time now it's time for us to be recognized for all that we have done for this country it's time it has to happen and now we're saying it's time This is the tone going into the next era of America. This is the tone going into the next decade. This is the future of America. This is the future of the world. So, the greater America, they can either, they can either get on board, or they can fight against it and get ran over. Same thing goes for the Muslim community. The American Muslim community, they can either get on board, or they can get ran over. But it's not just us and what we're doing. It's what God is doing. And all we have to do is look at Moses. Go to go back to go to the Quran. Read the stories of Moses. And you'll know our story. I'm going to leave it there with Assalamu Alaikum and Juma Mubarak.